good afternoon to everyone present for the webinar series of India Juris. I and Anya Rastogi welcome all participants and speakers on behalf of India Juris for the 22nd webinar on the topic setting up funds and gift city with special reference on angel funds, FIF, says compliances and taxation. India Juris is a leading law firm providing full legal services, pan India and the global market. It has also been ranked number one in private equity and venture capital transactions by the Venture Intelligence Report. India Juris has launched this webinar series to spread awareness and knowledge among interested audience regarding fund setup and the benefits offered by the Gift City. Through this series, I am proud to uh, tell everyone that we have been able to reach more than 2000 people till date. And we have received tremendous feedback that our series has been instrumental in helping various attendees spread information about Gift City to their own clientele. In today's seminar, we have participants from a diverse range of sectors like funds, professionals, consultants, advisors, even students and academicians. <clears throat> to enlighten our participants, we have our eminent speakers. I would first like to introduce the speaker, Mr. Mihir Upadhyay who is a Director General Manager at IFSCA in Division of Investment Funds. He has more than 17 years of experience in VC and private equity transaction across sectors, financial sector regulator, management, consulting, and banking. Currently, in IFSCA, he is responsible for registration, regulation, and supervision of venture capital funds, private equity funds, and hedge funds. I welcome Mr. Mihiru Pandya. Our second eminent speaker is Mr. Vaibhav Gupta. <clears throat> He's a partner at Dhruva Advisors, Advisors LLP. He's a CA by profession based in Dhruva's Delhi office. He has more than 17 years of experience in mergers and acquisitions and advisory services. He specializes in family offices, gift city and IFSA structures, among various other uh, things. He's an active columnist in India's leading financial dailies and journals. I welcome Mr. Vaibhav Gupta. Our third eminent speaker is Advocate Samir Rastogi. He is the managing partner of our law firm India Juris and has more than 20 years of experience in representing clients in various sectors like private equity, venture capital and many more. I welcome Mr. Samir Rastogi. I now will welcome Mr. Samir Rastogi to welcome our eminent speakers and proceed with the webinar. Thank you, Ananya. Thank you for the good introduction of the speakers and about the webinar. How we are doing. So welcome all. I welcome all the participants here. And uh, the webinar is set in the format that uh, we try to give interaction with the regulator, their inputs, how, what the Gift City is going on. We give information about how to set up a fund in Gift City. And then we have expert on the taxation on the various aspects of the fund. So our first speaker, Mr. Uh, Mihir, he, he had a, some urgent meeting called at the last minute. So he would be joining later part. So first we'll go with the setup of fund. Then we have a taxation aspect. And then in the last, uh, he would join us to give us brief on the gift city, how the things are happening and to take on the FAQs from the audience and participants. So, Thank you, Vavav. It's a pleasure to have you again. And your sessions on taxation of fund has always been a very much you know, uh, appreciated by the audience, the participants. And uh, I received a lot of comments from all of India that the content was excellent. I mean, I was in last time in Gujarat, vibrant. I met so many people. And uh, in Gift City office, I had met many people that they had attended our webinars and they found the content uh, very excellent. I mean, excellent. I would say many of the people have gathered information from this and they have really benefited. So thanks thank to you. you for sharing your information and your content over this. So thank you, Samir. Thank you, Samir. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So so friends, we'll start with uh, uh, the pre with my presentation on setting up fund in Gift City. Then we take on with uh, uh, Weber on taxation aspect, and then we. Uh, the regular joins us, Mr. Mehir joins us, we'll go with that particular thing. And then we go for FAQs. A lot of developments are happening in Gift City and uh, you all must be hearing about it. 
So I'll discuss many things about it in the due course of this uh, webinar. So let me put my presentation to take you through. So I think my screen is uh, visible to everybody. So friends, when we go for setting up fund in Gift City, and we come across a lot of people who want to set up fund in Gift City, the first question is, what are the documents required? How much time it will take? What is the money involved? You know. But before all these questions, I suggest to everybody think over what is your strategy? Why you want to set up a fund in Gift City? where are your investors located and where you would be investing the money. Based on that, what has to be done in Gift City, what kind of structure has to be put, what kind of uh, asset manager you have to uh, make, all those things have to be decided. When people come to us, they generally say, oh, you just set up this, this, this for me in Gift City. But that is not the right approach. I mean, sometimes your objective may not get fulfilled what you have gathered the information. So it's better to first discuss your objectives, your strategy with your consultant who is helping you in setting up in Gift City and then decide what kind of structure you wish to take in Gift City. So let us friends get on to the structure fast and then we have a lot many interesting things to know about it. So in Gift City, this is the snap snapshot. The whole fund setting up a fund, operation of the fund revolves around the FME regulations, which is fund management enti entity regulations. So around this, everything revolves. And you will get all information about the fund setting up operations in these regulations. These are available on the IFSCA website, international. So I'm repeating because of the people who are audience first time, International Financial Service Center Authority website. You will get this updated regulation as of today. There you can download and get all the information about how to separate the fund and all those things. So this regulation, they were uh, published in April 2022. And our first on Gift City webinar we did on April 22 itself. The first webinar we did. Since then, we have been doing it on a monthly basis. So in these regulations, there are in these regulations, mostly you will find three parts. One is about fund management entities where it provides three kinds of management entities like authorized FME, registered FME non-retail and registered FME retail. And what kind of funds, what kind of schemes these FMEs can launch. The, another uh, section which deals with venture capital schemes, restricted schemes, non-retail and retail schemes. And other things which are third part, which is which are under this regulation relates to Portfolio Management Services, Investment Trust, Family Investment Funds. So Family Investment Fund has been trending a lot in the media, in the financial and economic circles. So you would hear more about it in due course. So these are the regulations to see about if you want to set up a fund or any kind of entity in Gift City. So this is a typical structure of a fund, a normal structure of a fund which is set up in Gift City. So wherever I am mentioning schemes, it, I, it means fund. I am referring to a fund because the regulation uh, uses the word scheme, but it is equivalent to the fund. So when I say yeah, setting up a scheme means setting up a fund or launching of a scheme means launching a fund. So in center, you see there is a fund which is by entity wise generally formed as a trust. There is another player in the in this structure, which is FME, which is fund management entity. Normally, you would know it by the name of asset manager or investment manager. Then you have a trustee who acts as a watchdog for the investors, which is trusteeship company registered with the regulator or with the SEBI. They are used here. And then who can be the investors in these fund? It can be foreign investors. It can be Indian investors. And obviously, when it's an Indian investor, you have to see the FEMA angle has to be complied with. And they invest through LRS. And depending upon this, where these fund can invest, you can see down below, they can invest within IFSC, outside India, and so forth. 
in the units of different apps and all those things. So this is a typical standard structure to just to have an idea that what kind of thing you are going to set up in Gift City. So friends, when you talk about uh, forming a fund, if you are getting on with any consultant or any law firm or any lawyer, so what are the major documents they will be making for you? One is private placement memorandum, which talks about your strategy, everything about the fund for, you know, a Bible of the fund, basically. A trust deed, the fund which you call the scheme, it is registered as a different entities. It can be registered, but generally it is registered as a trust. So the deed of that trust, is one of the major thing. So that is to be, that is there. Third document is a contribution agreement, which is between the investors who would be investing in the fund. And fourth document is investment management agreement, which is between the fund and the uh, investment manager, FME, which is in this case is FME. So when somebody says investment in the fund, it means fund is the trust and in the trust, the trust bank account is the place where all the money will come in by the investors. So it is clear for all when we say we are putting money in the fund means it the money is going into the bank account of the trust. And against that, the investors will be getting units of the trust. So, so when we talk about FME, so we there are three type of so we are this I'm just uh, going through the snapshot of the FME and this is all these all the information which are very much required for you to understand the whole gamut of this and why you are setting up. So authorized FME, this is one of the most basic investment manager entity which you can make in Gift City. The second level is registered FME non-retail and third FME, the highest level of the FME is registered FME retail. So I have written the regulations which are there uh, where these things are provided in the regulations. It's easy for you all to find it out when you are going through the uh, regulation. So what the first, the basic kind of FME does, it can invest in early stage ventures through venture capital scheme. Okay, so venture capital scheme means they would, this kind of investment manager would launch venture capital fund. It raises money from the accredited investors or the investors investing about 250k dollars. So in, when we are talking about gift city, we are talking about investments and everything in foreign currency, maybe dollars or whatever it is. It can launch or it can manage family investment funds as well. And the major criteria is minimum net worth is $75,000. So this FME, when you are going to register with this uh, uh, gift city, so that requires a $75,000 minimum net worth. So when you are deciding what kind of FME, you have to see whether you can fulfill this criteria, this is the major thing, whether you can fulfill this criteria or not. So second category is registered FME where the investor can invest above 150K. So it can provide in addition to what authorized FME is doing, they can do PMS, portfolio management services, multifamily investment manager for private placement, REITs and invest. If you want to set up this kind of FME, then the net worth is 500K dollars, half a million dollars is required. And if you want to go to third one, then the minimum net worth is 1 million. 1 million dollar net worth is required. So you have to, when you are strategizing your thing, you have to see which whether you, how you will be fulfilling all these criteria because these criteria are required when you are making the application to the regulator. So all these FMEs, what kind of funds they can launch, like authorized FME, this venture capital fund is there, scheme is there. You can launch restricted schemes, retail scheme, it depends upon for what kind of a scheme, which FME you require that you have to see, which we have just spoken. So venture capital scheme is launched by FMEs to invest primarily in startups, venture capital, early stage. So if you are into that sector, if you are investing in that kind of undertakings within uh, outside India, within F IFSC, or India, in India only in case where the money is from abroad. So then you can use uh, authorized FME and make uh, venture capital fund over there in Gibb City. So in this, you can have a, you can have uh, 50 investors and green channel subscription is uh, 
available in this. So in the and in the next, if you see the things are quite written over there, so you can have maximum thousand investors, and in retail there is no you can have small investors and all those things. So these are the three broad categories: what kind of fund they can launch and what kind of FME you can you have to form. So now what we see here, it is the key feature of the FMEs. So type of schemes means what kind of fund these FMEs can manage. So the first, the basic category can manage venture capital schemes. The second category can manage VC venture capital schemes or funds and restrictive schemes offered, of which generally you would say CAT2 kind of fund and registered uh, retail, all schemes offered to investors. So these are the type of funds or schemes these FMEs can launch. So accordingly, wherever, whichever is your target investment area, investment side, you can decide on uh, which kind of FME you have to make and what kind of fund you have to launch. So FME form, what is the form of the FME? So because formation of FME is one of the critical thing that you and rest you can do easily is a procedural one. So deciding your FME, so FME in case of authorized FME can be a company, LLP or a branch of any existing company. So here what I'll just tell you and in second case also company LLP or a branch and in third case it can be company and branch. LLP is not allowed in third case. So here when we are talking about branch, it can be a branch of any entity which is regulated entity in its jurisdiction. For example, if you are a fund or any other entity which is regulated or registered by SEBI, then you are an RBI or, or any regulator, then you can be you can be called as a regulated entity and the net worth of this company can be counted for the net worth of your branch in IFSC. So in that case, you need not, if you have a regulated entity in India, you can open a branch of that. You need not to set up a separate company and have a separate net worth requirement. So now basis this, you can check whether you want to set up a new company as an LLP or, uh, or you want to have a branch office of your existing, any of the regulated entity. So minimum net worth, again, as I mentioned, uh, in FME is mini, one is 75K, then is 500k then is 10 uh, 1 million so you can see which criteria you satisfy and then you and what kind what kind of investors these fmes can use so it is accredited investors or in first case 250k and then 150k and and non retail investors there is no limit on that and in case of uh, first and second you can see if there are the employees and directors they can invest 60k in first case and in third and in third second case they can invest up to $40,000. So this is the relaxation for the employees and directors of the investment manager. So what kind of, so the next question people ask, do we need to have put our own office there? How many people we are required to keep there? And what are the infrastructure facility over there? So you got good infrastructure facility in IFSC, you can go and you can take offices on lease or there is an incubator. You can go and take the seats over there, which is quite economical, fully serviced. In case of authorized FME, minimum one is required. Principal officer, you have to keep with the relevant experience. In second case also, you need one principal officer plus one KMP with relevant experiences. And in third registered FME, you need three people, one PO plus two KMP. And as far as director are concerned, in third, in a registered retail, you can see you need four directors and 50% has to be uh, independent directors. So launch of schemes when these FME is set up, then what kind of funds they can set? You can see that they can uh, authorize the FME. They can immediately upon filing of the PPM, what you do, you prepare a PPM, PPM which is filed with the regulator. And thereafter you get a, a confirmed formation from them and then your fund is launched. So. Here it goes straight, you file, green channel is available, but at least in this case also, if we have the regulator at last order, they will give, can do, give you the more light on this, but still when you file PPM, you get a confirmation, then only you launch it at the moment. 
So in the second case, it takes 21 days. In first case, is, is it is immediately. And in third case, you have to see what kind of, uh, if they have shared any comments with you, then you have to accommodate those comments in the PPM and then you can launch it. So the experience of the people which you have to keep in case of third, in first two case, they only say the relevant experience is required. But in third case, you see that experience of minimum five years in managing. So these kind of people you need to put in your uh, office at, uh, you know, in a uh, gift city. So gift city is basically a financial place. You don't have houses in it. There are there are offices. Your people can live in, can work in gift city office in Gandhinagar and they can, uh, they can be residing anywhere, maybe in Ahmedabad or nearby or something. So key features, so skin in the game. So now you have set up an FME. So like everywhere, capital contribution is required from the promoter of the funds, whoever is managing the funds. So skin in the game means you have how much money when you are launching a fund, how much money you have to put in. So that is again one of the criteria to see that what kind of money you are required to put in. Basis that you can decide what kind of fund or what kind of uh, FME you want to launch. So if the target corpus of the fund is less than 30 million, then authorized FME is required to put 2.5% of the target corpus and maximum they can go up to 10% of the target corpus. Similarly, you can see that in case of registered FME, it is, you can see the numbers are self-explanatory, 2.5% of the target corpus. In case of open-ended, it is 5% of the target corpus. And in case of a retail, 1% of the asset under management of the scheme or 200k. So these are the contributions required by the investment manager to put in in the fund. So now the next question is when I need to do I need to put on the very first day. So as you draw down the money, so you maintain that percentage. So if, if the target corpus of the fund is more than 30 million, then the numbers are there. You can see 750k and 10% of the target corpus. This is what kind of contributions are required from the investment manager. So when you are starting a fund in Gift City, you should have that kind of uh, arrangement of the funds which you would be investing. For in case of an angel fund, so the authorized FME would launch an angel fund. There are a few angel funds very active in Gift City and most of them are served by our firm. They are doing good investments out of Gift City. So angel scheme, in case of angel scheme, the target contribution, the contribution by the investment manager is 2.5% or 20K. So it is less. But if, uh, and the contribution requirement is to be fulfilled by FME or is also within 45 days. So now what happens? So you can also get a waiver of the contribution if the uh, members are, if your investors allow to that. So now the, that was the, we just saw the features of the investment managers. So now we are on what kind of fund these FMEs are launching and what are those features. So the fund, which we call fund, fund can be set up in the form of company, LLP or trust. And in third category, it is only company and trust. And the decision is based on the taxation. And I think in WebUp's session, we'll have more light on the taxation aspect of different structures. So what kind of fund it can be, It can, the first two categories are, first is only close-ended. So if you want to launch an angel fund or a category one fund or a VC fund in Gip City through a authorized FME, then it has to be a close-ended fund. Okay. And in restricted, it, it can be closed and open both. And in the third also, it is the same. The corpus, what, what should be the minimum or what should be the minimum and maximum corpus of the fund? So in first category, the corpus has to be five, uh, 5 million or if you are setting up an angel fund, then it is 1 million is the lowest amount, what can be the lowest corpus and maximum 200 million. And similarly, you can see in the other category, the uh, corpus is written there. So these are the corpus. So if somebody is uh, thinking to launch an angel fund with 2 million, so that would not suffice because the minimum corpus fund required is um, for let us say for angel fund it is 1 million. Normal VC fund, if somebody wants 3 million, 
it would not work because it is 5 million is the lowest minimum corpus. So each scheme or each fund, how many investors can be there? We said in first category, maximum can be 50. In second category, maximum can be 1,000. And in third, there is no restriction. So you can see the minimum number of investors in a scheme. There is no, it is not in case of this uh, third minimum 20 investors has to be there. So minimum contribution from an investor in any scheme, we just saw okay, what is the minimum. If it is not a, a credit investor, then the, in first category 250K, in third category it is 150K. So that kind of commitment uh, the investors have to give in if you are trying to uh, get investors onboarded. So you have to see that these kind of minimum commitment they would be giving. So tenure for venture capital scheme, the tenure is three years, minimum three is three years, which can be extended up two years with the consent of two third investors. Similarly, in restricted scheme, close ended minimum one year, extension up to two year. And similarly for retail. So these are the tenures for which you can launch the funds. So based on your strategy, you can you know, decide upon it. So there is no, in first category like venture capital fund, there is no outer limit, minimum is three years. So you can put a five year or six year or seven year, got too long of a fund would be difficult for your investors to wait and get that. So five, six years plus two years like that. Investment in, so in investment in unlisted entities, so there is no restriction. And in case of a second open-ended max 25% of the corpus and close-ended, you can see no restriction. So these are the how in what kind of uh, entities they can invest that is mentioned over there. So investment in associate of FN. So permissible subject to 75%. So if, as if the F, if there is a company where you want to, yeah, where the fund want to invest and it comes under the associate of an FME category, there's a definition provided in the regulation for the associate. Then unless 75% of the investors agree to that, you cannot invest in an associate. So similarly, it goes to other categories of fund as well. Valuation frequency. So when you set up a fund, you have to get your portfolio evaluated at the end of every year. So the frequency means, so in case of a venture capital fund, you have VC scheme, you need an yearly valuation. All ecosystem is available in Gift City. You have valuers, you have fund accounting, you have tax advisors, all everything, whole ecosystem is built in Gift City. You can hire whichever is your preference over there. So in case of a second category, close if it's a close-ended fund, then it is half yearly. You have to do twice a year. In open-ended, you have to do a monthly and similarly. So you can see these kind of expenses will come to you when you are evaluating your portfolio and coming around the valuations. So these expenses, you can decide what about what kind of expenses you are charging to your investors. So you keep everything in mind when you are deciding on that in your PPA. So leverage. So in VCM, leverage is permissible. In second also, it is permissible subject to disclosure in PPM. In third, you can see it is not except to certain temporary liquidity needs. So custodian. So if the asset under management is greater than 70 million, then only it is compulsory for first two categories. And in third category, it is anyway compulsory. So you can decide upon if the, your fund, suppose if your fund is 100 million fund in Gip City, then you require a custodian as well. So you can hire the any custodial services provider in Gip City. So friends, this I have written permissible investment by all schemes. So all the schemes which are, whether it is VC, VC scheme or retail, non-retail, they can invest in all A to F, uh, I, which is written there, like securities issued by unlisted entities, subject to the regulation, but these are the places where they can invest. So additional restrict conditions, what is on restricted and retail schemes, means category two and three funds, which were there in the columns, may invest in derivative, including commodity derivative, subject to disclosure in PPM. So this is additional condition for them. Close-ended restricted scheme may invest up to 20% of corpus in other physical assets as may be specified. So physical asset, I mean, if you want to buy some physical properties or something, so that kind of investment can also be made by close. 
So retail schemes not permitted to invest in the unit of mutual fund and AIFs in IFSC. So this kind of, so basis this, you can decide the investment strategy, what kind of FME, what kind of fund you launch based on your objects. So friends, this was a broad structure of what the whole framework, it goes in city of a fund. So we are on the, so how you set up, there are two regulators. There is one SEZ and IFSCA. So you need approval from the both regulators. You need an IFSC approval. You need an SEZ approval to finally start your any entity, whether you are a uh, family investment fund or a FME or fund, whatever. So you require these two regulators. So how it goes, you go and uh, get a place. You need a physical office place in Gift City. So many people ask, do we really need an office? Yes, you need a physical place. You have to go and take the physical office in Gift City to operate. So the, oper the application has to go to the SEZ. The application has to go to the IFSCA and with both approval, then you get the final approval and open your bank accounts, get your uh, GST, GST tax uh, done. You, you have to get IEC code, export import code because that is required for invoicing and all those things. So when you complete all that, finally you get a certificate for operation from the IFSCA. First you get in principle, then final, and then you are ready to go with the uh, fund or entity in Gift City. So friend, this was uh, basically, this was a fast overview on Gift City, how we are uh, doing. And uh, I think with this, uh, uh, we will take up the FAQs in last. So with this, uh, I would, without uh, losing any further time, I would invite Weber from uh, Dhruva Advisors to again enlighten us on the taxation aspects and various aspects of the funds and do let us know whatever new insights you have or whatever economic or some developments are taking place in view which you want to share for the benefit of the audience thank you most welcome Weber. please thank you thank you samir thank you and it was really insightful to hear you as always samir and i think your experience on gift city really adds and brings a lot of value uh, while I put up my slides, I've got a very brief presentation. The yes. only thing that I would really add is that Gift City is like a very ever evolving concept, right? And, uh, you know, number of things keep on uh, getting done here. Uh, you know, for example, just last evening, there is a, uh, you know, the, the entire listing uh, rules got not notified, which basically enables companies uh, Indian companies, unlisted Indian com companies to list their shares on stock exchanges in the gift city without really doing a simultaneous or a prior listing in India. <clears throat> Again, a very, very interesting development, uh, not related to the funds discussion that we are having today, but I think maybe a discussion for some another day. Yeah. But again, a very, very interesting development, something which has been eagerly awaited as it happens the rules that have been notified have their own nuances. We hope some of the inefficiencies in the rules will also get corrected as we move forward. As you know, we, we, we have been seeing that the authorities are very, very open to feedback and they've been wanting to plug wherever there are inefficiencies and bottlenecks. So I think in that sense, developments have been happening on the positive side in the gift city and uh, as advisors to clients, we personally, are very, very positive and very, very bullish about Gift City. It opens up new avenues for financial planning. And, uh, you know, we'll always try to bring our knowledge, our experience uh, for the benefit of the audience. <clears throat> I think I'm facing some technical issues in sharing my slides, but uh, uh, I'll maybe just, uh, you know, walk you through. I will not be able to put up the slides on the screen. But so essentially, if you can send to Tanya, then she can put up, she can share. Let me try doing that. Let me if you can send to Tanya, she can share there. Sure, sure. Just give me one sec. I'll just do yeah. that.
Great. I've just sent it to Tanya. Tanya, if you could yeah, yeah. open it and share it. I've sent it to you on WhatsApp. Yeah. <clears throat> While Tanya puts up the slides, uh, I think what we'll do, maybe spend the next 10 minutes or so going through the various tax provisions that, that are applicable to uh, this entire fund management activity in the gift city. So essentially, there are three sets of entities that we need to look at. Uh, one is the AIF, which is set up in the gift city, whether it's a CAT 1, CAT 2, or a CAT 3 AIF, and what are the tax provisions that are applicable to those AIFs. The second is the fund management entity, which is the fund manager to the AIF, and how we look at taxes on the fund manager. And the third is the family investment fund, which as Samir said, is uh, is a lot in the news. We've got uh, the biggies of corporate India wanting to set up uh, a family investment fund in the gift city. There has been some movement there. Some approvals have been granted in the recent uh, few weeks. Uh, and we'll look at how taxes would apply on, on a family investment fund set up in the gift city. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. <clears throat> so this is the broad fr fund structure, which we all are aware about. You've got, you'll be basically have a fund management entity in the gift city, which is the FME box that you see on the right, uh, which will uh, set up and manage the fund uh, along with the sponsor, will be the sponsor to the fund. Uh, and then this fund or the scheme of the fund will raise money, pool in capital from various investors, uh, typically uh, overseas investors. And the fund could, will then be investing into various companies. And these investing entities could be in India, they could be very well outside India as well. So this is a typical fund structure. And as I said, it is important to look at the taxability of this fund stroke scheme itself. It is important to look at the taxability of the fund management entity. And in the context of a family investment fund, it's important to look at the taxability of the FIF. <clears throat> Tanya, if you could move forward, please. Yeah, so uh, next slide, Tanya. So when it comes to uh, the taxation of the fund, scheme itself, which is the AIF. Uh, now we'll need to see whether it's a CAT 1, CAT 2, or a CAT 3 AIF. And the taxation really is pretty much the same as a domestic AIF, where uh, you know if it's a CAT 1 or a CAT 2 AIF, uh, for all incomes other than business income, uh, the AIF gets a tax pass-through status, which would basically mean that the income, whether it is a dividend or a capital gain, will not be taxable in the hands of the AIF, but it will be taxed directly in the hands of the investors uh, and the tax treatment and tax rates would hence depend on the, the residential profile of the investor. If the investor is a non-resident, he would also get access to the tax treaty, the applicable tax treaty. And if there are beneficial rates under the applicable tax treaty, then those tax rates would be available. So long as the investors are residents, uh, then the taxes will depend on the nature of income. If it's in, in, in the nature, nature of dividend, that is get, that gets taxed as ordinary income on the current tax regime. If the nature of income is capital gains, uh, then depending on whether it is long term or short term, the tax rate could be uh, anywhere from 20% to normal tax rates. <clears throat> Uh, if there is any income which is earned by this fund from any offshore investments, then to the extent the investors are non-residents, that income is not taxable because that's not income accruing or arising in India. Uh, so that's that's how you look at a CAT 1 or a CAT 2 AIF. When it comes to uh, Category 3 AIFs, here the tax pass-through status is not available, which means that the income is taxable in the hands of the AIF at the applicable rates depending on the nature of the income. And hence, consequently, the income is exempt in the hands of the investors. Here, for AIFs, CAT3 AIFs registered in the gift city, there is a specific exemption available for AIFs where all the units, all the units held, all the units in the CAT3 AIF other than the sponsor and manager units they are all held by non-resident, which would basically mean that to the extent uh, there is a CAT3 AIF where all the investors other than the sponsor and manager are non-residents. And if that AIF gets any income from transfer of certain specified securities, 
which are essentially securities other than shares of any indian company then that income is not taxable in the hands of the air so that's an exemption available to a specific category specific you know type of cat 3 ais as i said all investors other than manager and sponsor being non residents <clears throat> also for such an ais any dividend or interest income that it receives that is taxable at a lower tax rate of 10% and if the aif then distributes any income to its investors which are non residents or the non residents transfer the units in the aif that income again is not taxable <clears throat> then if you could move to the next slide so that's the tax regime applicable to an aif in the gift city now we look at how a fif is taxed now an fif interestingly uh, could be set up either as a company llp or a contributory trust here there is an interesting aspect that merits discussion is that under the indian tax laws there is a tax holiday available two units set up in the uh, in the gift city where a 100% tax holiday is available on any income which is arising out of the business carried out by such a unit for a period of 10 consecutive years out of any uh, out of the first 15 years so so the units could pick up a block of any 10 consecutive years in the first 15 years of setting up and any income received during those 10 years from the business carried out by such a unit is eligible for a 100% tax holiday when it comes to a family investment fund the here because the family investment fund itself is the registered fund management entity or the authorized fund management entity let me put the right technical term uh, and you don't need a separate fund manager there is a very strong view that all incomes of such family investment fund whether it is in the nature of a dividend or a capital gain on sale of any investments or interest income or any other income all of that income should be it should be you know one should be able to take a position that all of that income is linked to the business carried out by this uh, fif and hence the tax holiday is available on all of such which makes this entire proposition extremely attractive from a tax perspective now if you know if the fif is availing a tax holiday and if it is set up in the nature of a company then if there will be no mat also which will apply mat is minimum alternate tax that also will not apply so long as this company uh, which is in the nature of fif opts for the 22% tax regime under section 115 bwa <clears throat> uh however if the fif is set up in the nature of an llp so if it is set up in the form of an llp while the tax holiday should still be available to us uh, to 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 it there will be an alternate minimum tax which is just like vat uh, that will apply uh, on that llp at the rate of 9% Uh, however the alternate minimum tax again is creditable over the next 15 years uh, where against any normal tax which is payable after the tax holiday is over the alternate minimum tax paid in the last 15 years will be available as a credit tanya <coughs> uh, if you could move to the next slide yeah the last set of entities as i said where we need to look at the tax uh, implications is the fund manager entity uh, which is relevant more for the aifs where you will have a fund manager entity in addition to the fund scheme itself here the fund manager entity is again entitled to the 100% tax holiday for the 10 years out of 15 years for any income that the fund management entity will earn which would typically be in the nature of a management fee Uh, so there is no tax for those ten years period on the management fees. Uh, again, from the you know perspective of minimum alternate tax, if the com if the fund management entity is again set up in the form of a company, 
which has opted for the 22% tax rate, then there is no VAT also. However, if there is, uh, if it is set up in the net, you know, in the form of an LLP, or if it is set up in the form of a company but has not opted for the 22% tax rate, then uh, a VAT will apply at the rate of 9%. <clears throat> in terms of GST on the management fees that the fund management entity will earn, uh, there is no GST. There is a GST exemption provided specifically on, on such a fees. Any distributions to be made by the fund management entity to its investors or shareholders, will the tax treatment will really depend on uh, two things. One is uh, the nature of the entity itself, uh, the nature of the fund management entity itself, and also the residential status of the investors. Uh, just as an example, if the fund management entity is is a company, then any distributions that it makes will be in the form of dividends, which are taxable in the hands of its shareholders uh, at the rates applicable to such shareholders. However, if the fund management entity is an LLP, then any distributions of the profits by an LLP to its partners are free of any further taxes for the partners. So they can be taken out tax free completely. <laughs> In the overall context uh, of Gift City, one important thing that one must keep in mind is that what is the residential status for tax purposes of the gifts of any entity set up in the Gift City itself? So as we all know, and as Samir mentioned, from a FEMA perspective, Gift City is considered as overseas uh, jurisdiction. So in that sense, any entity set up in the gift city is considered as, an, as a person resident outside India for the purposes of FEMA. However, from a tax perspective, from an income tax perspective, all such entities are considered as tax residents of India. So they are not considered non-residents. This is a very important distinction to keep in mind because uh, not only does it impact the tax rates that are, uh, you know, that are applicable, but also there is a very in important concept to keep in mind, which we call in tax parlance, something called the place of effective management or POEM as, as we call it in, in, in short. Now the concept of POEM really is, is applicable on a foreign company where it means that if the, if the foreign company is effectively managed from India, then that foreign company is considered to be a tax resident of India. In the context of a gift city entity, the concept of POEM will not apply because the gift city entity is not a foreign company for tax purposes. And hence, we don't really need to worry about whether a POEM will apply, whether this will be considered as a tax resident of India. It is by default a tax resident of India. <clears throat> So this pretty much is the uh, spectrum of taxation, which is applicable to funds and associated fund management entities in the gift city, whether it is a family investment fund or an AIA. With this, I would hand it over back to Samir uh, and we can maybe take up questions as Samir mentioned in the end. So thank you, Bhavav. It was as usual. Every time I see your presentation, I learn a lot many things. And really, and I think our uh, participants would have uh, uh, understand a lot many things and we'll have a lot of questions. But in the meantime, Mr. Mehed Upadhyay from IFSC has joined in. So in the interest of the time, we will have a short, uh, instead of presentation, we will ask him to just uh, address us on how things are happening and what is gift about gift city and then we will straight away go to the q and a session from the audiences if there are the questions and we'll take off but at least we would like to hear something from you sure thank you samadhi uh, for this and wonderful presentation by you and also by viva at least many things on the taxation right even we try to understand and that gives a lot of clarity so thank you for that viva I wouldn't take much of a time. So I guess the regulatory part is already covered by Samir. The tax part is covered by Weber. So what I can give my two senses on the fund management side and what is currently happening. 
So uh, when we uh, at this stage when we are sitting, we have in the current development close to around about hundred and three funds which are already approved, and uh, eighty eight FME entities are already uh, authorized or I would say registered by the authority, and all together this funds put together will be raising close to around about $30 billion. So there's a good amount of development which has happened in the last three years and particularly after the fund management regulations uh, came out. And we also seen good amount of traction which is happening when it comes to the relocation of funds and um, quite a good amount of money. Uh, I think it should be close to around about four to $5 billion have moved in that direction as well. So that is something which uh, we are doing. A healthy set of uh, uh, inquiries, applications, and all those things are on. Uh, and I guess it is all uh, the confidence which our uh, GPs or the fund managers in India and also the global guys are showing, uh, which is there. Uh, of course, the law firms and the consulting firms are also there helping uh, to make this uh, Gift City as the true international financial center. And last but not the least, even Nadia has been granted an approval. So uh, that is first in the making. I hope uh, there are many such uh, global sovereign funds and pension funds would be coming in gift. So over to you, Samir. Maybe we can head to Q&A from this. Yes. Yes, thank you. But uh, uh, we were just in the start of this session. We were discussing the yesterday we had the direct listing uh, uh, which, has, uh, which has been notified, which has come up. So we have a lot of things so we are discussing with Baba. We would definitely have some session on that. Yes. And uh, Baba have, on his LinkedIn has posted certain pros and cons, which I did see. And they were really very much uh, thoughtful. And uh, we would definitely bring those points to the regulator that these are the pros and cons of that. So in so, forthcoming sessions. We'll so, be more than happy to uh, you know see it. Maybe I have not seen Vibos post, but definitely... I'll see it, bring it to the notice of my concern. Uh, Division Chief is looking into this side of it. As he rightly mentioned, intent is right. It has been done. Uh, from our side, we have done the regulatory uh, uh, legislation was in place. Maybe certain tweaking which is required. Is, I think the team is already on it and you should be able to see it very soon. Uh, something on that front as well. So hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, we would like to see a listing happening sooner than later on this front. Yeah. We are all excited for that. So we have one question. Uh, I mean, uh, Mirji, you can take this up. Uh, as if, as in domestic AIF, multiple schemes can be launched in Gift City. Whether one scheme is one AIF or under one AIF, multiple scheme can be launched without registering a separate trustee. So <clears throat> I would say regulation has enabled uh, both ways of doing things. So uh, what currently uh, maybe someone is doing in uh, the domestic side is having one mother trust and then multiple schemes under it that is enabled. But uh, what we have seen in our experience uh, is that at GIFT IFSC, uh, if you do one trust, one scheme, uh, that is better in terms of getting an asset liability, uh, you know, ring fence for the investor side of it. But we have enabled both. We have both the kind of, uh, you know, registrations done at place. So it depends on how convenient it is for the fund manager. Maybe there is some, uh, because over here, people would be taking, I would say, the GSC credit. And as for the SEZ uh, law, only the trust is recognized vehicle. So what happens is that for the scheme level, you don't get a GSCN number to claim a credit. So for that purpose, what people do is they have only, uh, they do one strategy, one trust. Uh, that is how it is done for a convenience sake for that. But if at all somebody wants to do multiple schemes uh, under a single trust, it is permissible as per IFSC regulation. Okay. So can a foreign national set up FIF in Gibb City? Certainly, we will love to. Yes, yes, yes. So Gibb City, so I would take this so in Gibb City. So Weber, you can just throw a light on this. No, no, absolutely. A foreign national can definitely set up an FIF in the Gibb City as so, you just mentioned. I think in I would IFSA say... regulator is more than happy to receive <laughs> as many as foreign people registering FIF. 
So we all want more and more foreign residents to set up FIF in Gibb City. I, I would say our idea was that we need to have both. We wanted foreign nationals to come and set up and explore this as a territory. At the same time, we also wanted the Indian nationals who are resident in India also to come here and start exploring uh, investments in the foreign jurisdiction for diversification purpose. So uh, more than happy... Uh, people from any part of the world can come and set up an FIF. So, Weber, there is a question. Is GST registration compulsory for FIF? No. G GST registration is not compulsory for FIF. No, uh, but uh, I thought ki in uh, whenever you are establishing any entity in Gip City, you would uh, uh, require GST because you have to file returns or zero return or something. Some... So you can just throw on the GST aspect of it uh, for any entity which is registered in Gibb City, uh, except other in general sure. with any fund or anything. So, yeah, sure, Samit. So basically, the way it works is that because in FIF there is you don't need a separate fund management entity, so there is no element of service, right? You are managing your proprietary funds. Okay. GST registration is required whenever there is an element of service being rendered. That is where that registration becomes compulsory. Okay. So that's a, I mean, knowledge to me also, it's good. I mean, so that's a key point that in FIF, we are managing our own fund. Hence, we are not providing service to any third party. Okay. Yeah. Great. So has a, has a registered retail scheme opened in Gift City? Gift City? So, so at this point of time, there are uh, firms which have taken a retail license, but they have not filed for a retail scheme as on date. Okay. Okay. So generally many of, uh, we come across a lot of people, they say, okay, that we, uh, is it a, uh, possible that we open an FME in Gift City? Not me, but various other clients who are taking it uh, as a business. They would set up an FME in uh, Gift City and they would have a lot of global clients coming in for them. They provide ready-made to launch their funds and schemes. So is that uh, workable? So, Samirdi, that's more of a platform play and we are still uh, debating or deliberating on this particular point. But at this point of time, we have seen the people who are running the actual fund and the actual strategy and who owns yeah. the investor, they have come. So, this point is still under deliberation. Uh, let me put it that. So, Vaibhav, you can take this one. If the can a shareholder from different industry can... Oh, it is changing so fast. So can a shareholder from different industry can promote a FME? Certainly they can, as long as they are able to meet the criteria, which is mention of fit and proper, getting the network, I'm sure they'll be able to do it. But for non-retail or authorized, definitely they'll have to showcase uh, through their KMPs, which they're going to employ, that they demonstrate the experience of running a fund or having that third-party fund management experience. Then definitely they can do that. So I think in our presentation, we had shown various requirements for an FME. If they are fulfilled, then any person from uh, would be, can open. So there is one thing, can, uh, in AIF regulation, periodical returns for AIF are not defined. Whether AIF is required to file any returns periodically with IFSCA. Uh, there are certain circulars which are issued uh, by the supervision division. So what happens is that the AIF, since we regulate the FME, the uh, AIF returns are clubbed in the FME filings which they have to do as to what they are doing and also frequency and all is mentioned in the uh, circulars which are issued by the authority. So there is one question, okay, how Gip City can accommodate and support tech marketing firms looking to establish its presence? So we have a full-fledged fintech division over here and uh, if at all there are business ideas in case, uh, definitely uh, you know the firms or individuals can reach out to the division. Uh, there are provisions of sandbox which are there. So maybe the idea is at the conception stage or you're still trying to figure it out. Uh, maybe you can speak with the team, make an application for the sandbox if uh, that is how they provide and then from there you migrate to a full-fledged regime if the regulations are there. If not there, maybe based on uh, the experiment or I would say the sandbox result, appropriate regulations can also be designed. 
So who, whoever wish to set up their startup or their such entity in Gift City, uh, you can write an email to the official email ID. They can have a Zoom or a virtual interaction, understand your things and take it forward there. So it's more so, of uh, TechFin and FinTech currently, which are the part of uh, the code. So it, is... it has to fall in the definition of FinTech startups, which you are at the moment doing in the Gift Or a TechFin. Which right. again related to the finance side. So, uh, whether there is a question for you, whether it will be governed for FIF, whether FIF will be governed under Section One One Five UB of the Income Tax Act, passed through yeah. Section. So, can you take this up? Yes. Please. Sure, sure. So, uh, Section One One Five UB covers only Cat One and Cat Two AIFs. FIF is not governed by Section One Hundred and Fifteen UB. Uh, which would have, which would mean that uh, FIF will be taxed depending on what its residential, what its incorporation status is, whether it's a company or an LLP or a trust. So one one five UB does not apply on on an FIF. So one, I have other, otherwise also I have questions received separately on my mobile. So how is carry how carry would be taxed in a uh, in fund? The so SME carry would, which is getting a carry or the sponsor yeah. who is getting the carry, how they are taxed? Yeah. So very interesting question, Samir. Uh, now, as I said, any entity, a fund management entity, which is a unit in the IFSC is eligible for a 100% tax holiday for the first 10 years, right? Now that tax holiday applies on the income, which is derived from the business of this unit. Here, what becomes important is that who is holding the carry units and if mm -hmm. that that holder is a registered unit in the gift city and if it is, then can the income from carry also be called to be income derived from the business of that unit, right? If it can be, then uh, the carry, one should be able to claim a, a tax deduction if that carry is received within the tax holiday period. Otherwise, it was, it will be taxed uh, again, you know, carry structuring becomes important whether you want to, you know, tax it as a normal uh, business income or uh, should it be taxed as capital gains. That depends on how that entire carry is structured. And what is the uh, taxation of capital gains? If an investor residing outside is getting a capital gains in FI in the gift city fund, then what is the taxation? Is it uh, tax free or India Indian fund has to deduct TDS on it? How it is? So that will again depend, Samir, on the nature of the fund, whether it's a CAT1, CAT2, or a CAT3 AIF. CAT1 and CAT2 AIF, as I had mentioned in my presentation, get, get a tax pass-through status, which basically means that any capital gains earned by the fund are directly taxed in the hands of the investors. And the fund under Section 115 UB is required to do a tax deduction also, do a TDS, and then uh, you know uh, the, the distributions are made to the investor. Which of also would mean that if the investor is a non-resident investor, then the benefits of the tax treaty also should be available. Okay, okay. great. So I think we are overrunning our time for, but last question from Mr. Mihirji. Uh, would be there, achha, a question, so somebody has put, too early to ask, would there be fungibility of securities listed in Gift City and domestic exchanges? Yes, that's too early at this time, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So one thing from uh, Mr. Uh, I would ask. Uh, I think uh, one of our client would approach the regulator. This there's a uh, situation in angel fund. When an uh, in uh, angel fund has invested in a startup or in a early venture stage company, so the regulation provides that if you want to make a subsequent investment, it has to be same set of investors. Yes. But now the situation is new investors have onboarded. This is a live question which I'm asking. I mean, we can <laughs> need not to answer. But so now new investors, because their startup has grown from 5 million to it has gone to 30, uh, 36, 37 million valuation. And investors have a huge interest on it. So new investors have been onboarded and they want to invest. And now the fix is how to invest because the invest set of investors are different. So the whether the regulator can provide some based on the case presentation some something can be done on this somebody for this i would say we'll still go with the current regulation if at all please make a representation we may yes. consider it and we'll have to see what else can be done or how it can be 
then what are the risk inside of it so answering on a live one yeah, yeah. No, yeah. but it requires a larger deliberation at some level yeah, yeah. so that's i can i mean if the participants are who are see if they have any questions of if they are already operating in gift city they are most welcome to write to the regulator and ask the present their cases and whole detail they can put forward and i'm sure the regulator comes out with a good solutions every time so people are encouraged to approach them and get the things done so i think sir with this uh, we would uh, conclude our webinar and uh, thank you meher ji for taking out time i know you are busy you are called in some meeting at last moment sure. but thank you for uh, participating and coming down thank you weber for excellent once again excellent on uh, taxation aspect of it and whatever uh, for the part uh, for the benefit of the audience what we have done we have started preparing faqs of all the webinars so and which is available as a pdf it is available on our website so this whatever questions have been asked in this webinar so we will have a huge faq like ifsc has issued one faq we have raised the made a huge faq which people can access and they can get the answers of what have been asked so th those questions are not as a legal opinion but it's just an view overview of that so thank you all of you thank you meher ji thank you thank bravo you. We'll thank, you, Sameer, thank, you, thank you thank you very thank you very much thank you bye bye thank you thank you As India Juris, we aim to be the best place for the lawyers to work in and set up standards for the lawyers to develop their skills being in this law firm. We aim to provide high standard of international legal services to our international, global and domestic clients. India Juris is having innovative strategies with regard to intellectual property rights disputes as well as international dispute resolution and we are having a lot of milestones which we have achieved and about to achieve at India Juris as a full fledged law firm we are advising corporates startups for their advice on ipos and further transaction matters